Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive.
Thank you, Wendy and Sydney. You guys might not know this, but they've been practicing and working on that piece for over a year now. And due to COVID and all sorts of other scheduling mishaps, they finally got to play it, and man, we're thankful we could hear it. Um, friends of Jesus Christ, the Lord is risen. And whether you're here in person or you're joining us by means of the live stream, we're so excited to be worshiping with you today. My name is Zach Van Wyk, and I serve as the Student Ministries Director. And this morning, I'd like to offer an extra special welcome to Matthew Gitchelar, a Calvin Seminary student who'll be helping to lead us in worship. Thank you. This morning, we're called into worship, and so I invite you to rise, whether in body or in spirit, to hear that call to worship, which comes from Psalm 100, where the psalmist writes, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joy joyful songs, know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us and we are his, we are his people, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord greets us in this place with his grace, mercy, and peace. And as you've been greeted here and welcomed, I invite you to turn to those worshiping around you and offer a wave, an elbow bump, or simply the words, the peace of Christ be with you. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. 
sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. children in rejoice rejoice let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice so church of Christ rejoice come those whose joy is morning sun Weeping through the night Come those who tell of battles won And those struggling in the fight For his perfect love will never change And his mercies never cease But follow us through all our days With the certain hope of peace be seated. Um, Just a few announcements for you this morning before we go to the Lord in prayer. Um, The first is that we've welcomed Galen and Susan Biker's membership to our church. So Galen and Susan, if you want to stand, we welcome you and we're thankful to have you with us. Um, Next is that Raj Rauda continues to recover um, following heart surgery this week, so keep him and his recovery in your prayers. Um, We also, um, we mourn and pray with and for 
the Mike and Mary Fulcoma family, their children, and Mary's parents, John and Elsa Van Hecken, and the passing of John's mother this week. A service will be held in Grand Rapids tomorrow. Um, and then finally, um, yesterday morning, a longtime member, Polly Hookman, passed away peacefully. Um, so there will be a visitation from 12 to 1 with a funeral service immediately following on Tuesday here at church. With these concerns and so many more on our hearts, and minds, will you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you with the promise of spring in our heads. Many this week have celebrated the change of seasons by heading to a warmer climate, and many have celebrated by staying closer to home and watching the trees bud and the flowers grow and the grass turn green. We're thankful for these signs of spring and the reminder of the new life that you offer us, that they give us. It is thanks to your promise of new life that we can proclaim, death is defeated, he is alive. Lord, this was a gift we didn't earn, and we don't deserve it, and so we thank you for blessing us with it anyway. We're overwhelmed by the ways that your mercy show up in our lives every single day. And yet we pray, Jesus, break our hearts for what breaks yours. We confess that this world is pretty full of brokenness, and more often than we want to admit, We have a part to play in that. And so we ask for forgiveness for the times that we've fallen short, for we know that the list is long. And Lord, we pray for the many faces of injustice and hatred and bigotry that show up in this world. We pray for the victims of those things. Lord, we mourn with those who mourn, and we pray for those who help in moments of brokenness. We pray for first responders, for doctors and nurses, and for all the other helpers, whoever they may be and wherever they might be. We pray for our leaders, whether they're here in Fremont, in Lansing, or in D.C., we pray that they lead us with clear heads and in ways that respect the dignity of each person as your children. Lord, this week we pray for the admin team as they meet and continue, along with the rest of the council, and their charge of leading our church. We pray for our faith-promise-supported missionaries, as they work around the globe to bring your good news to people. And Lord, we pray for those this morning who are rejoicing and celebrating. We rejoice and celebrate with them. And we also pray for those who come here with heavy hearts. We think especially of the Van Hecken, Falkema, and Hookman families. And Lord, we pray for those of us who are somewhere in between. Whatever the posture of our hearts this morning, we pray that you enter into that space with us and overwhelm us with your grace, mercy, and peace. Only you know the desires of our hearts, and so we ask that we find rest for our souls in you alone. We pray, Lord, that as we prepare ourselves for this week, that we set our gaze on you. It's so easy in our world full of noise and information and social media to lose sight of you in the crowd of all the other things. And as people of the risen Lord, we pray that this week, as we focus on you, that we live into our call to know you and make you known in our families, in our communities, and in our world. Lord, may people know that we are Christians by the way that we love you. We pray this in the name of our great Redeemer. Amen. At this time, I invite any children who are here who will be going downstairs for story hour to come forward and receive a children's blessing. All right, kiddos, we send you down with this blessing. God so loved the world, he rose from the grave for us. May you feel his peace, may you know his grace, and may you experience his love. The Lord be with you. And also with you. All right. Would you like to carry this down, Cole? Thanks, buddy. My soul finds rest in God alone. My 
my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. The wilderness may bless and times may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me. I'll fix my heart on righteousness, I'll look to him who hears me. to take a hold I'll cling to my salvation Though riches come and riches go Don't set your heart upon them The fields of hope in which I sow Are harvested in heaven Oh, praise Him, hallelujah My delight and my the curse of death and I am his forever oh praise him hallelujah my delight and my reward everlasting ever failing my redeemer my God oh praise him hallelujah my and my reward everlasting ever failing my redeemer my God Good morning. It's good to be here with you to worship God together this morning. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5. And we'll be reading the entire chapter. Before we read God's word this morning, let's come to him in a prayer. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord, amen. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master 
and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you can cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please, accept this gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, two, prof two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away, and they left. When, when he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you? when the man got down from his chariot to meet you. Is this the time to take clothes, money, or to accept clothes, or olive groves and vineyards, or flocks and herds, or male and female slaves? 
Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. This is the word of the Lord. Our text this morning contains one of the most powerful and unexpected stories of restoration and conversion in the Old Testament. Naaman, a mighty warrior and commander of the army of Aram, is healed of leprosy, comes to faith, and turns from idols, swearing allegiance to God alone. Naaman is a very unlikely candidate for God's grace for a number of reasons. First, Naaman is a Gentile, someone who is not part of the covenant people of Israel, descended from Abraham. Second, Naaman does not worship God, but instead follows the gods of his own country. Third, Naaman is an enemy of Israel. He is commander of the army of Aram, a country to Israel's northeast in modern-day Syria, and Israel's most dangerous neighbor at the time demonstrated by the fact that Israel's king, upon reading the letter from the king of Aram, panics and tears his robes in despair. He thinks that the Arameans would use Naaman as an excuse to attack Israel if he were not healed. Fourth, Naaman is unclean because he has leprosy. In Leviticus, God instructs the Israelites that those with infectious skin diseases, like leprosy, must live alone outside the camp of Israel. They could not participate in public worship. Naaman could not have gone to worship the Lord with others, even if he had been part of Israel and had wanted to. These were the many cultural and ceremonial barriers between Naaman and God. But despite these barriers, Naaman has been healed, and he, the military leader of Israel's pagan enemies, declares that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Through his healing power, the Lord has turned an enemy of God's people into a true believer whose faith outstrips the faith of many of the people of Israel, many of whom had turned from God to worship Baal. Because of the miraculous nature of Naaman's transformation, we would expect the story to end happily in verse 19, when Elisha bids Naaman, go in peace. Everyone should leave happy, celebrating and praising God for the healing of a leper and the conversion of an idolater. But the story does not end in verse 19. Instead, we are introduced to Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, who is not thrilled, but is instead bitter that Naaman has been healed and allowed to leave with the wagon loads of expensive gifts he has brought. Gehazi says to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. Images of the glistening gold and silver and the rolls of bright soft cloth in Naaman's wagons and all the land, animals, and servants those riches could buy danced in Gehazi's head. Gehazi was jealous of Naaman's vast wealth and did not think that Naaman deserved the blessings the Lord had given him. When Gehazi looks at Naaman, he sees a Gentile foreigner and a despicable enemy commander who has no right to experience God's grace and blessing and leave Scott free. Naaman was not part of God's chosen people. He was an Aramean. He had killed Israelites, raided their villages, and taken captive their sons and daughters. And now, when he had been brought low by disease, he was able to find restoration from the very people he enslaved and killed. And he was healed for free. All he had to endure were the slight indignities of not being greeted personally by Elisha and having to bathe in a dirty river. Gehazi thought that Naaman did not deserve to be healed, or at least it should have cost him something. There was a price that needed to be paid, 
And Gehazi thought that price should be a talent of silver and two sets of clothing for the Gehazi retirement fund. He runs after Naaman and delivers the fake message he concocted on the way that two young men from the company of the prophets have come to Elisha and, and Elisha wants to give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. Naaman, still full of gratitude for God's healing through Elisha, insists that Gehazi takes two talents of silver. With the help of two of Naaman's servants, Gehazi brings his spoils back to the city and stows them away before going back to Elisha, thinking that his plan was a success. He had plundered the plunderer of Israel, and justice had been done, or so he thinks. Elisha asks Gehazi where he has been, and Gehazi lies, saying that he didn't go anywhere. But Elisha reveals that he knows exactly what Gehazi has been up to. He then asks Gehazi a rhetorical question. Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes, which were the things that Gehazi had taken from Naaman? Or olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, or manservants and maidservants? We can assume that these are the things that Gehazi wanted to buy with the money he took. The answer is obviously supposed to be no, since it is God in his free grace who healed Naaman. It was true that Naaman did not deserve to be healed, but that's the whole point of grace. It is not deserved or earned. It is not paid for by the recipient, but by the giver. Furthermore, for Elisha to have accepted a gift, of God's grace, a gift for God's grace would have been to take credit for God's healing work. It would have made it look like God's grace can be bought and sold for a price. For coveting Naaman's wealth, taking advantage of his gratitude, and putting lies in Elisha's mouth, Gehazi receives Naaman's leprosy along with the goods that he has taken. The story ends with Gehazi now in even worse standing than Naaman, that Aramean. He is unclean, destined to a life banished from the people of God. He is plagued with an outward sign of his corrupt inward attitude. Sadly, Gehazi's actions and attitudes toward the Gentiles were not uncommon in Scripture. There was too often the idea that since Israel was part of the covenant of God, that they were the only ones who could or should be blessed by God. They thought that God's grace was exclusive to them. Even one of God's prophets, Jonah, thought that God's mercy should be for Israel only. He refused to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, at God's command, to tell them to repent. He refused because Jonah knew that God might spare them. It took a furious storm, nearly drowning, and being swallowed and spat back up by a giant fish to get the reluctant Jonah to Nineveh and warn them of the destruction that was to come. When the Ninevites repented and God did show them mercy, Jonah became so angry that he wanted to die rather than to see them spared. Even though God had spared Jonah from drowning despite his own disobedience earlier, many Israelites liked Gehazi and Jonah became complacent, thinking that because they were in the covenant, they deserved God's mercy and grace, while the Gentiles only deserved God's wrath. The truth is that Israel did not deserve God's grace any more than the Gentiles. They were not chosen for how good they were but because God was good to them and because God had a plan to bless the rest of the nations through them. When God made his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12, God said that he would not only bless Abraham and his descendants, but also that he would be a blessing to all the rest of the nations. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Israel was blessed so that they, in turn, could be God's instrument of blessing to the nations, to people like Naaman, 
the Aramean, and all the people of Nineveh who did not know their left hand from their right. That is what Gehazi did not understand, that God's plan did not end with Israel, but began there so it could go out into the rest of the world. Like Gehazi and many of the Israelites throughout scripture, we in the church today sometimes think that we ought to be favored by God and receive free grace, while others ought to be rejected by God or require some sort of payment for salvation and blessing because they are not like us. Or we expect some sort of special recognition and distinction over others. We make all sorts of arbitrary distinctions and requirements that distort the good news of the gospel. We separate people biologically, claiming superiority for a certain gender or race or level of health, ability, or attractiveness. We separate people economically by wealth or field of employment or employment status. We separate people politically based on our own positions on the important issues and who we vote for. Socially, we choose to interact with people based on who their friends are. Morally, we look for whether or not others partake in certain behaviors and accept or reject them according to how we would rate their actions. Depending on whether or not people check the right boxes in the, all these different categories, we accept some and reject others on the basis of our own preferences rather than on the word of God, which asks only for faith in Jesus Christ. There seem to be two tendencies people have to viewing their relationship with God and others. The first one, which is the one that often creates the distinctions that I just talked about, is to act superior to those unlike ourselves. It might seem obvious to us why God should bless us and deliver us from our troubles and sins. We are overall pretty good people. We haven't done anything that bad. We're part of a church and a better one than a lot of the others out there. And yeah, to demonstrate in our reformed circles, you might hear jokes or comments that the doctrine of election makes reformed Christians the frozen chosen. Those who God has already decided to save, and therefore we don't need to worry about how we live because it's already accomplished. The sense of superiority in all these examples is the attitude of arrogance that Gehazi had. It is the attitude that Naaman had when he went away angry that Elisha did not come out and stand before him and instructed him to wash in the dirty Jordan River. It is an attitude that does not recognize our own shortcomings, only those of others. We too often are happy that God has saved us by his grace and we do not recognize that like Israel, we have been chosen in order to bring blessing and the good news of our salvation to others. We might think that since God loves us, he couldn't love those who aren't like us. We might see others who we think are undeserving, blessed with success or riches, or delivered from illness and trouble, and think that God was too easy on them. We become jealous, bitter, deceitful, and hypocritical. Like the older brother in the parable of the lost son, we demand some sort of reward for our good behavior instead of rejoicing that our brother who was lost has been saved and celebrating by joining in on the party. When we let our jealousy, bitterness, and ideas of superiority go unchecked, we might find ourselves becoming just the ones who, who are most in need of grace. The truth is, we are all sinners who disobey God hurt others, and fail to do what we ought. We as people in the new covenant in Jesus are included by grace just as much as the others we might believe are more sinful or inferior. The second opposite tendency is to see ourselves as worse than others and beyond God's mercy and salvation. We might think that the claims and actions of others that tell us that we are less than them are true. 
We might look at the bad things we do and think or the good things we fail to do and think and shudder in horror, believing that God might be able to forgive others, but surely he wouldn't be able to forgive us. This attitude leads to despair and does not grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is because it can truly cover all sins, minor as well as major. In both of these prevailing attitudes, we restrict the gospel of God's grace from its true extent and falsely exclude others or ourselves from the people of God. In his greed and arrogance, Gehazi misunderstood God's plans for redemption and mistook God's gracious plan as a mistake. The good news for Naaman was that God never meant salvation and restoration to be only for the people of Israel. Though God had indeed chosen Israel as his special people, he chose to bless them so that they in turn might be a blessing to others. God's mercy and grace were specially shown to Israel, but they were by no means restricted to Israel. Mercy and grace were also going to reach all the rest of the nations. God used the Israelite servant girl who served Naaman's wife to appoint Naaman to Elisha and through Elisha to God. The servant girl's actions show us on a small scale how God wanted Israel to be a blessing to the nations. Even as a lowly servant, she was the means by which God brought healing and salvation to the great warrior of Aram. Naaman could come to Israel and be healed by God because grace is not based on race, health, or past actions, all of which Naaman was lacking in. It is a free gift that Naaman accepted by faith. It was a glorious deliverance that ought to have been celebrated by all who heard about it. Naaman's healing and transformation gave the Israelites and even the Arameans a foretaste, a sneak peek of the healing and salvation that would be unleashed at the coming of the Messiah. If we jump ahead in scripture to the New Testament, we see that Jesus was sent to point to God's grace and to be the way through which everyone can receive it, Jew and Gentile alike. God knew that no one deserved to be saved. No one could ever pay the price for sin and live forever with him. So God paid the debt himself by sending the son to be incarnated and die the death that sinners deserve on their behalf. He could stand in the place of sinners because he himself was without sin. Not only did he die, he was raised again, undoing the power of death so that all who believe in him, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, men and women, rich and poor, could receive eternal life. He accomplished the ultimate salvation and liberation from all diseases and divisions, and we await the ultimate realization of that new creation when Jesus comes again. God's gracious plan was enough to free Naaman of his leprosy and bring him to faith and salvation, despite the barriers between Naaman and God, and his grace is also enough to cover our sin and brokenness and overcome the barriers we create. God's grace is so wide that it covers all the earth We can say with confidence that our world belongs to God, not just one hemisphere or continent, cultural or ethnic group, social class, or even church denomination. God is able to tear down the arbitrary barriers we build between him, ourselves, and one another. In 1983, Nico Smith, a Dutch Reformed church pastor in South Africa, started a ministry called Koinonia, which is the Greek word for fellowship. This ministry brought black and white South Africans together to share meals in each other's homes. This was during the time when the races were divided into separate churches, schools, and neighborhoods under the policy of apartheid. In a time of intense racial tension and conflict, 
These believers were able to work toward breaking down the barriers and stereotypes that divided and categorized the different races in South African culture. By acknowledging the true gospel contained in God's word, they saw each other as fellow humans who, according to God's word, should be able to eat together, worship together, and share their lives with each other. This ministry and practice became one of the powerful forces in bringing about the end of apartheid and allowing for the first racially inclusive election in South Africa just over a decade later. Just as the gospel worked in the lives of the members of Koinonia, the gospel has the power to expand our view of whose lives God is at work in beyond the barriers we establish. God stirs us to recognize the extent of his love, that it reaches well beyond us. God's grace changes us so that we can let go of pride and understand what we ourselves have been forgiven of, enabling us to rejoice with others who have been forgiven, rather than harbor resentment that those we deem unworthy are also saved. God's love extends beyond all trivial boundaries of race, class, health, ability, gender, and politics that we set up, and all the others. And one day, we will all join together in the new creation as the church of all ages and places, united in Christ. And as we wait for that glorious day, God calls and equips us to continue to proclaim and live the good news that is for all the people, that salvation is available by God's abundant grace through faith in Jesus Christ. He came and ministered among us, was crucified for our sins, and was raised up in victory over sin and death. He reigns over all of creation and will come back one day to restore all things. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your love extends to all types of people and over all of creation. We thank you that your ways are not like our ways, that you do not keep your saving power from certain people or groups that we, in our pride and arrogance, deem unworthy, but extend it to people of every sort. Help us recognize that we all need you and that we, poor sinners that we are, are not beyond your grace. We thank and praise you for the gift of your son, Jesus, by whose wounds we are healed. Equip us by your Holy Spirit to deepen our understanding and faith in the truth of your gospel so that we may love you and our neighbors well. Amen.
as we go forth from this place, we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. He came to live, live a perfect life. He came to be the living word, our light. He came to die, so we'd be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing. Thank you.